Hello, and welcome back to Rewildology, the podcast all about conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell Norman, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. If you've listened to the past couple of episodes, you'll notice that I've been a super busy bee building new things for you all. Last week, I announced the brand new Rewildologist community Facebook group designed to bring us all together and give us a safe space to chat about conservation and all of its weird and wacky ways. I'd absolutely love for you to join as well. Just search for Rewildologist in Facebook groups or click the link in the show notes. This week, I have another announcement for you. I will admit that I'm embarrassed to say it's taken me this long, but I've finally built a newsletter to keep you all up to date on the latest episodes, new things going on here at Rewildology, and all the new exciting developments that I've been working on. To sign up, head over to rewildology.com and simply input your email address and the little pop-up. That's it. I'll handle the rest for you. All right, everyone, that's all for this week's announcements. Now on to today's show. Last week, we met Kayla Fratt, founder of Canine Conservationist, and learned all about conservation detection dogs. Today, we're exploring a different and very important canine job, anti-poaching dogs. In this episode, I'm chatting with Jack Gradich, who is a director for Dogs for Wildlife. And that is the number four, not F-O-R, just in case your careers are looking it up. Jack is a passionate rhino conservationist currently working with a breeding group of black rhinos in Wales, UK. His love for the natural world and dedication to protect it led him to form Dogs for Wildlife. This organization is awesome, everyone. They train anti-poaching dogs in the UK before deploying them to reserves across Africa. Their experienced team provides everything that reserves need in order to utilize these amazing dogs effectively. This includes advice on kennel design, handler training, toys, handling equipment, care advice, and continued support once the dogs are deployed. Pretty cool, right? A lot goes into selecting, training, and deploying an anti-poaching pooch, which Jack explains in detail. He also shares what it's like to start a not-for-profit organization from the ground up and everything that goes into that. I really believe in Dogs for Wildlife and think they're a fantastic nonprofit to support. If you'd like to connect with Jack or Dogs for Wildlife, email them at info at dogsforwildlife.org or visit their website, dogsforwildlife.org. If you like this episode, share it with a friend or put it on your Instagram story and tag Rewildology. Rating and reviewing this show wherever you're listening is also super helpful for organically helping others find the podcast. All right, everyone, on to my conversation with Jack. Thanks so much, Jack, for coming on. I'm just so stoked to talk with you and like our little mini conservation dog series we have going on. So, but before we get into any of that, since you have such a cool story and history, take me back to your childhood so we can know Jack full picture. Where did you grow up? What was it like? You know, were you in nature? All those things. Uh, thanks, Brett. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, so I grew up on a very rural sheep farm in uh, southern England in the UK. And um, yeah, it was very rural. We lived a mile away from a from a road and um, just surrounded by nature all the time. And, and it really just inspired me to want to work with nature, really. I did think about going down the farming route, but uh, I saw the struggles that my parents went through. Um, it's a very hard industry. And they actually gave up um, sheep farming when I was about 10, 11. So, um, yeah, after school, I then went to Sparshot College, which is in um, Hampshire. And it's quite a renowned college for um, animal care. It's a land-based college, which means that it traditionally ran um, agricultural courses. And it's very sort of, it's it's more sort of hands-on than academic. Um, But they do now also offer degree courses and even some master's courses as well. So I left school in 2008 and I was at Sparshot College for five years. Um, I started on a national diploma in animal management and then I progressed on to the BSc degree in animal management. um, And I left in 2013 
Um, but throughout my courses, I would um, do various volunteering and work experience at zoos, wildlife parks, poultry farms, <laughs> That's awesome. um, which I loved. And end up, I ended up getting a, a job there for the summer. Uh, being surrounded by 4,000 free-range chickens was, oh was amazing. <laughs> oh, that sounds um, like so much fun. <laughs> and they even had alpacas there, which they used for controlling the foxes. They actually chase foxes off and protect no the chickens. Way. Are you serious? So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, that was really cool to have some exotics in, in amongst the chickens. <laughs> Um, I've digressed. Uh, no, this is great. Yeah, so I, I, just, did... I just got stuck. I was like, you what? 4,000 chickens. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, it was chicken heaven. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so that was it. That was an egg farm. So we, they produced um, eggs for Waitrose, which is a big uh, supermarket in the UK. So that was, that was quite an experience. Um, but the experience that really stuck with me was the first time I, I worked in a zoo for a week which was just down the road from my college um, called Marwell Zoo. And um, I, th- my first day I was working with on the giraffe section and I had a real love for giraffes ever since then. And uh, ended why? Up what was it about it? Later that, on. Why, why was it about that experience that really just you um, know, I spoke think, to you? I think the first time I went to a zoo, I have quite a vivid memory of going to Marwell Zoo because it was one of our local zoos. And... The position of the giraffes there, um, as you go into the zoo, you walk down this long uh, tarmac path and up on the hill to your left, you've got the giraffe house and they just looked so magnificent up there on on Mm. top of that hill. And it was one of my first experiences of an exotic animal. And I just remember thinking, wow, there are actually animals like this that exist. And yeah, I ended up working with them for a week, which was absolutely amazing. And it was my first experience working in a zoo. I hadn't had any experience in a zoo before. I didn't know what it entailed other than seeing things on the TV. Um, but yeah, that's where my my real love of uh, more exotic animals rather than farm animals uh, started to develop. And um, yeah, as I went on to my degree, I went to other collections like Longmeat Safari Park, Foxworld Wildlife Park. And also Folly Farm Zoo, which I now work at. And uh, so I ended up staying there. (laughs) After my degree, I got a job on the farm section at Folly Farm. The farm and the zoo are separate. Um, Quite an extensive farm section with various rare breeds, um, sheep and chickens and uh, all, all your domestic animals. And what I'd do is I'd have two days off and one of those days I'd spend volunteering on the zoo section. Mm. So it's quite a long week for me. Yeah, um, it sounds like it. <laughs> and completely exhausting, but ultimately <laughs> worth it because I ended up getting a job after a year of doing that. Um, so you volunteer so- for a year on top of working in like the part that's also associated, and it still took a year to land a full time job on the zoo side. Yeah, it was it was literally just waiting for a position to come up, mm. and um, so luckily I was. You know, I, I moved to the area. It's in southwest Wales, which um, is about a three-hour drive from where I was, where I grew up. Mm. Um, so it was quite a move. I have got family down here, um, so they very thankfully put me up um, for a year. And um, then when I got a full-time job, I, I moved out from there. And yeah, now settled. So yeah, I've been on the zoo since 2014. And in that time, it, a lot's happened, basically. It's quite, quite a, a young zoo. Um, it's called Folly Farm because it originally started as a dairy farm and um, they had to find other ways to diversify because the income from farming wasn't great. So they opened up to the public in 1988 and um, they basically had public uh, watching the milking and then they got a few sheep and a few lambs and uh, then eventually a few rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> Because, <laughs> you know, that's just a logical progression of how this works. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we got rhinos, which are now a, a great love of mine. A year after I, about a year and a half after I started on the zoo, I was involved right from the start. So I got to see the whole process of designing the enclosure and choosing the right species and uh, researching that species 
going to other zoos, learning what they do, which works well and what doesn't work well. And uh, we can find a middle ground from there. So yeah, a lot of research before they even arrived, because it obviously it's quite a big responsibility. And so we had two black rhinos join us in 2015. And yeah, a male and a non-breeding female to start off with. And then in 2017, we had a breeding female recommended to come and join us. And things went really well from there. In 2018, she mated with the male. And 15 months later, in 2020, the beginning of 2020, our little calf was born, Mm. which was the first for the zoo, first for mum, and also the first rhino to be born in Wales as well. Oh my gosh, really? Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, it's that's that's my career journey so far. And a couple of years ago, I also helped to set up a not-for-profit organization called Dogs for Wildlife. It's my (laughs) (laughs) t-shirt. Well, first of all, before we get into Dogs for Wildlife, my biggest question that I was just thinking as you're saying that is why rhinos? Why was that a a selected species to come to your zoo? Because I mean, that's a major investment to build a facility that can hold them and give them the proper care. So a little bit more about that of, of just why and how. We are quite a big site and uh, we wanted to have a a larger development. Uh, We felt that we could offer space and and a good environment for larger animals. Um, We already had giraffes and camels um, and antelope and zebra and things like that. So yeah, it was sort of a natural progression to Mm. get rhinos and also one of the founding directors of the park. Um, It was always a great love of his to uh, try and get rhinos to the park. Um, not only did he love the animals, but we also wanted to help them in some way. There's that big conservation push with rhinos. And um, for me personally, I never, I never really imagined working with rhinos until my manager said, "Do you want to work with rhinos?" <laughs> and like, you don't say no to that, really, do no, you? <laughs> <laughs> um, they're just such an iconic conservation species you know and there's so few of them as well uh the black rhino they say there's only around five thousand left in the wild like that's just nothing and the fact that we could have them and and look after them look after them well and contribute to a breeding program which is reintroducing animals back into africa as well is just amazing so yeah they just need they just need some help don't they Mm mm-hmm no, no, that's great. Th- thanks for expanding on that. So you briefly mentioned Dogs for Wildlife, which is perfect because that they you know that's why you're on. And that's what I'm so excited to just chat with you for until we're, we want to stop <laughs> about. <laughs> um, so how did that come to be? So at this time, you are a zookeeper. You know, you're living the, the dream, you know, from like a zookeeper standpoint. You have this brand new rhino enclosure that you were a part of and everything. So how did this nonprofit come to be and why did you feel inclined to get involved? So I first met Jackie and Darren, who are my colleagues at Dogs of Wildlife, um, when we first got the rhinos um, because they were, so basically Jackie and Darren are dog trainers and they approached us because they were helping to train dogs for other not-for-profits or other charities with a view to send them to Africa. And they were looking for zoos in the local area where they could take them, take the puppies to the zoo to get them used to the different animals that they'd experience once they're out in Africa. It's to really get them to ignore what's around them and just concentrate on the trainer, which then means they can concentrate on the job that they're doing. And you get a really good quality dog from doing that. So uh, Jack and Darren approached our zoo and we now allow them the dogs access every few months they bring puppies in which is an amazing day <laughs> i'm sure that it's puppies and rhinos oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah they you know they just walk around the zoo and um, before we open to the public and they're surrounded by the animals and any vehicles that are going past and you know all the smells are coming off these animals as well so yeah once they're out in africa they'll just hopefully just completely ignore their environment and as i say solely concentrate on the trainer or the handler 
so Jack and Darren um, wanted to do this on their own. So they previously trained dogs for other not-for-profits, but they wanted to start doing these dogs um, by themselves or train these dogs by themselves. Um, so they started to get donations through. And then a couple of years ago, I said, well, why don't we make a separate organization where people can get involved with our dogs? They can hear about their stories and they can, you know, donate uh, in a proper way to, to help fund this amazing cause. And so, yeah, two years ago, we set up Dogs for Wildlife. And so at the moment, we're a not-for-profit organization and we're just starting um, the process of trying to get charitable, official charitable status. So yeah, that's how it came about. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was just this natural relationship that built. It's like, Hey, you have the rhinos. My dogs need to be around rhinos. And I'm like, wow, you're amazing. I would love to be a part of what you're doing. Yeah. So it's just naturally. Yeah, fit. absolutely. And it was like, you know, meeting that puppy and knowing that it's going to help not just rhinos, but all animals from poaching. And it, it's just an amazing feeling knowing that it's got that potential to do that. Mm. And uh, I was just really taken aback by that and, and really wanted to get involved. Mm. Yeah. I, I understand that feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally understand that feeling. So let's actually talk about the dogs for a second. Well, I guess one, what do they do as an anti-poaching dog? Like, what does that mean? What does that job entail? And then how, how do they become an anti-poaching dog too? So an anti-poaching dog is a dog in our organization, the dog which tracks and apprehends poachers when necessary. So the, the tracking abilities of these dogs is absolutely incredible. They obviously use their strong sense of smell to, to track poachers through the bush. Um, some people have even stated that one anti-poaching dog is the equivalent of 10 rangers wow. trying to track um, a poacher. So they're very, very quick. Um, the other main advantage is that these animals can track at night. So they're not using visual, they're using smell and the smell doesn't go away at night. So that is a real advantage to having these dogs. So obviously a lot of poaching does happen at night, particularly on full moon. And um, that's when these dogs come into their own, really. The other reason is they're incredibly loyal. You know, some of the rangers that are employed, unfortunately, do succumb to bribery and corruption. So you know full well that a dog isn't going to be bribed. And so there's that sense of loyalty, which uh, surrounds these dogs as well, which mm. is, um, which is really powerful. Absolutely. I didn't even think about that. That's, I mean, that's completely true. When you're removing the human element out of it, there's all of those human tendencies that you no longer have to worry about. Wow. I, mm. I didn't even think about it in that sense. I'm really glad you just brought that up because the dog is going to do what it's trained to do. It just wants its reward or whatever it's ball, you know, like when it's going out to do its job, that's the only thing exactly. that's thinking about. Yeah. You can't bribe a dog like that. <laughs> no. And I mean, yeah, these dogs are, are so well trained. They wouldn't even take a, a chicken off you. <laughs> <laughs> So how um, are these dogs selected? Like, like where, where do these dogs come from? Is it a certain breed that is like very particular for so, this? Are they rescued or, you know, how, where do they come from? So, yeah, I mean, some, some organizations do use rescue dogs, but um, we personally don't. And that's because we breed all our dogs in-house ourselves. Oh, wow. So we actually have breeding individuals at the kennels. So we generally use the Dutch and Belgian Shepherds also known as Bel uh, Belgian Malinois. And these, these two breeds are really great for the tracking and apprehension work because they're, they've got a very good nose on them. They're very agile. They're the right size in order to apprehend or bite. You know, they've got a strong bite on them. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't train a poodle to, <laughs> a toy poodle to go out there and, yeah. uh, and apprehend poachers. So you're, you're very right. You do have to select the, the right breed uh, for the purpose. And um, they also just absolutely love it. You know, they're working type dogs. They're dogs which traditionally were bred as herding dogs. So they've got that, that momentum behind them. You know, they've got that energy behind them. So, um, yeah, it is quite important to pick the correct breed. Um, in terms of individuals, 
Um, because we breed the dogs in house, it means that even from a few days old, Jackie and Darren, because of their vast experience, um, they can actually tell which dogs might be suitable just from the way that the puppies are behaving with each other. And um, so wow. little behavioural, it is amazing to see and, and watch. When we have a litter and you just sit with the uh, with, with Jackie and Darren and they go, that one, that one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it is amazing sometimes obviously they do have to change their minds but uh but most of the time they're right because they've done it so many times they also train uh, police dogs as well so yeah that experience is invaluable and it's important that you have the the correct trait of that individual dog because some dogs can be too much and they're too hot-headed uh, for the job they won't work with you. They'll they'll want to sort of go and do their own thing. And then you get others that aren't confident enough. So you want a really well-balanced dog, a dog that's loyal to you and also one which you think you can sort of control a bit better. So yeah, it is definitely really important to pick the, the right individual. Mm. And how long does their training normally last before they've graduated and can go into the field? So we train the dogs here in the UK and they stay with us for about 18 months mm. before they're deployed out into various reserves um, across Africa. And that training begins from, you know, about, I say training, but I use that term very loosely, but they're, they're trained from around a week old. And I don't mean they're sitting when they're a week old. I mean, <laughs> um, it's things like exposing them to certain noises. So even when they're babies or even when they're puppies, you can train dogs to be at one with their environment and not, not be nervous. Um, for example, when they're being fed, you can play things via speakers. And when they're a little bit older, you can expose them to uh, other noises. For example, we use an empty plastic bottle with stones in. And when the puppies are on solids and they're eating out of their bowl, what we do is we shake that bottle above their head and it makes that noise and a positive experience because they're eating. So mm. it's training them in ways which you wouldn't really think of, but it's, it really helps to develop their confidence. Wow. And, and where do they go? So like, let's say you have these great dogs, it's time for them to be deployed into the field. I, I would imagine there's probably some areas or reserves that you're partnered with or, you know, continuing to partner with. So where do yeah. they go for their first job or continue on in their job? Yes. Yeah, so as Dogs for Wildlife, we've deployed two dogs so far. And the first one, Merwi, was deployed to Imire, Rhino and Wildlife Conservation Conservancy, um, which is in Zimbabwe. And we have really good links with them. Um, in fact, one of, one of our directors is the manager of Amire and his family set it up. So yeah, Merwi um, is out there at the moment and they're actually, we're actually training a second dog for them called Shinga and she'll hopefully be deployed in 18 months or so. And then we've got Bain, and he is in a reserve in the Rhinostopan area of South Africa in Limpopo. So, yeah, we've got those two reserves at the moment, and we, we are constantly contacted by reserves for help because, obviously, there's just so much devastation out there. Everyone is crying out for help, so we want to help as many reserves as possible, but uh, we also want to provide the, the quality of our dogs at the same time. So we do have to pick the reserves quite carefully to make sure that they've got everything in place. Yeah, I bet that's a... I mean, you want to help everybody. It's like, but we have to be very selective. I'm sure there's definitely a balance that you have to play when it comes to there that. Is, yeah. yeah, I mean, like I was saying... Um, we, we want to go for quality rather than quantity because there's no point in us training a load of dogs if they're substandard. There's just absolutely no point because they aren't going to be able to do their job as effectively as they could. We want the very best for these dogs and, um, and for the rangers. That's, that's why we do it. So, yeah, we definitely want to go for quality. Hmm. And so what is a normal day for an anti-poaching dog on the job? Like, what do they do? Um, so they, they basically spend a lot of time with the rangers. I mean, some of the rangers at Amire, they actually live next door to the kennels, like the kennels are attached to their house. So they form a very, very close bond and almost become extended families to the rangers. So I'll start off by explaining 
So when they get out there, obviously there is this period of time where they have to settle into their new environment. Uh, you know, they've had this, this long journey down to Africa and uh, they're in a different environment. So they have to get used to the, you know, the heat and also the new trainer as well. They've been with uh, Jackie and Darren for 18 months and now they're uh, with a new trainer. So there is that period of time where they have to uh, to adjust their new, new environment. And it takes around six months for us to be comfortable that they're, that they're properly settled. And we always go out again uh, after six months um, and sort of sign them off, if you will, and just to say, you know, they, they're ready to do their job and um, that we're happy that the rangers and handlers um, know what they're doing. And um, a lot of these reserves don't have dog units as well. So we have to actually go there and teach the handlers how to handle. And a lot of these rangers haven't even been around dogs before. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. And a lot of, a lot of them are perhaps a little bit scared of the dogs as well, because, you know, they're very strong, powerful looking dogs. And particularly the locals that are employed as rangers would never have come across one of these dogs before. So it, it does take a little while, but um, we also have to choose which handlers are appropriate for that dog. There's no point in us giving the dog a handler that can't handle it properly. Right. They have to work as a team. They have to work as a team at the end of the day. So um, if one of them, you know, messes up, then they both do. So they have to, you know, work together. So we have to pick the right handler for that dog. And we have to train the handler, which takes a little bit of time. Yeah, especially as they haven't been around dogs. And the other important thing to teach them is welfare. So animal welfare, um, how to actually care for them properly, what food to give them, when to stop, and, you know, just... Things like when to stop and giving them a drink, um, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> keeping them in good condition, um, body condition scoring, weighing. Yeah, all these things that you wouldn't think of, we have to teach them from very, very basics. And then we have to get them to use that dog as an apprehension and tracking dog. So it's quite a long process. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's say that the training all is all ready to go and they are ready mm -hmm. and it's like, all right, let's go do our job. What, what do they do? Like, what is their role when they're out in the field? What are they doing? What's their goal? What's all those things? Okay. So the role is um, to basically patrol the reserve with the ranger team. So they have to work together uh, with the rangers to patrol different areas of the reserve. And, um, you know, if the, if the ranger picks up on any signs of poaching, so if he tracks any signs like blood or footprints or um, disturbance in the habitat at all, he can then use the dog to track whatever he has found. Obviously, that very rarely happens. So sometimes they'll actually do a fake scenario. So they'll do a lot of training. They'll send someone out uh, for a few kilometers and then the dog has to go out and then track so as a fake exercise. So yeah, it's patrolling and training. And then there's also a lot of downtime as well. Obviously in, uh, in many parts of Africa, it's very hot in the middle of the day. So a lot, a lot of the time it's the downtime in the kennel, in the shade. And uh, you also have to have a lot of time for bonding between handler and dog. So there's a lot of play between the handler and dog. And we provide toys for them as well as part of the package. And, uh, and the equipment so that they can get this interaction, which is really lovely to see. Mm. I bet that feels so wholesome and satisfying. I would, uh, mm. I can only imagine if I was in your shoes, I'd probably cry every single time <laughs> one of like, your dogs <laughs> graduated in the field and doing well. Oh, it must just be so satisfying to feel. Yeah, mm. it's a great process to follow, you know, a little puppy from birth to right up to the time that is catching a poacher. It's just amazing. Another role that they have is to, uh, particularly Murray has um, in the local community, is to patrol the villages or, or townships around the reserve. And they found that it actually helps to reduce burglary and theft. Oh, really? Um, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why we want to send another dog to Murray because Murray is being used for that exercise as well. So they need another dog um, to then help patrol in the reserve. So their work it's very much a community exercise. So if the community feels safe with that dog around and they know the capabilities of that dog, they're less likely to poach in the reserve as well mm. because they know that she's around. Um, it's basically, you know, they patrol around the 
town and it's basically them saying this dog is here don't mess with her (laughs) (laughs) don't come into the reserve (laughs) she will find you she will find you (laughs) um but it's it's getting this mutual respect for each Mm. other it's it you know we don't want any hate we just want people to realize that she's there and uh they also have you know education programs where they educate the importance of wildlife so it, it's really mutual respect and really working with community. But the added bonus is that it helps the community because it reduces thefts and burglaries. And she has even been used to track some burglars. So there wow. is that benefit to them as well. So, I mean, it almost sounds like you might be able to create a whole new police dog force, which I know that you said that they also train police dogs. You might might be like <laughs> two wings of dogs for one. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So I know that there was one unfortunate story that you you told me that we'll we'll get to that. But first, before we get into any of just the things that happen in this field, is there any like crazy stories where she has found poachers and they have been stopped? Like any of those kind of like real success stories have you had yet? Um, So Murray, fortunately, she's only encountered, I think, one poacher and... Yeah, she did get that poacher. Um, it wasn't a rhino poacher. It was someone who was poaching uh, the fish in the lakes. But, you know, all wildlife in the reserve needs to be protected. Mm-hmm. And um, essentially, it was it was illegal hunting. So she helped to um, apprehend that poacher. I don't think any apprehension was used, but she definitely did track that poacher. Um, that was um, a couple of years ago now. So, yeah, I mean, thankfully, no more instances have occurred with Murray. Um, I guess when you introduce a dog unit, you also advertise the fact that you've got dogs. So there is that element that people are put off poaching in that reserve because the dogs are there. So um, I think that that definitely helps as well. Mm. Um, Like you were saying just now, um, we did have an unfortunate incident just yesterday where the reserve that uh, one of our other dogs, Bane, is at in South Africa. Um, two bull rhinos were poached. Um, yeah, Bane managed to track the poachers um, quite a distance, and unfortunately, it just led them to one of the roads, which then obviously the poachers made their de- their getaway um, with by vehicle, and they were unable to ascertain where they went. Um, but a full uh, forensic investigation is is currently underway, and so hopefully they can get some results from that. Um, but yeah, Bain did a great job in in tracking. It would have taken them, you know, hours and hours to do what he did. So he he's definitely an asset to that reserve. Um, there's just you know he he can't be everywhere at once, basically, and so. Um, the reserve is just is just too big for a, a small team of rangers. Bain definitely, definitely did help, but uh, yeah, hopefully we can we can help them out a bit more. Yeah, yeah, especially with poaching incidences, definitely been increasing. Some some countries have been having it. You know, it's been really great, but then others, without having tourism in these reserves and in these national parks, which that's the natural deterrence. Mm. Which um, right before this, I was talking with a guide, which who he's in Tanzania and just how there has been a major increase on the pressure on wildlife simply because of poaching for meat or for a source of income, um, for the illegal wildlife trade, which it sounds like that was probably what was going on with these rhinos as well. Right. It was just straight illegal wildlife trade, which was happening. Right. Yeah. Um, so basically two bulls were were shot. One had its horns removed and the other one actually still had its horns intact. So, you know, luckily those horns didn't end up in the trade, but it still died of its injuries. Um, it basically fled and we're guessing that the poachers couldn't then track that rhino um, because it was found quite a distance away from the other rhino. But yeah, such such a great loss. And yeah, like I said, We'll hopefully get some positive news that they found some forensic data on that. Mm. Mm-hmm. And do you think that more dogs would be a possible solution 
to poaching because when I was just talking with Kaylee the other day, she's like, unfortunately, it's still to the point where people think of conservation dogs as the last thing. They've tried everything else and then they're like, well, you're our last hope are these conservation mm. dogs. Oh, well, a solution isn't the right term because you got to stop the source to actually solve the issue. Are you also seeing something similar with like, anti-poaching dogs? Um, or is the community starting to be more open to having working with them? Or, or what are you seeing? I'm recently new to the, the dog field. But from what I know so far, I think people are becoming more switched on to the usefulness of dogs. And they're becoming a lot more popular, a lot more reserves. Um, and the, particularly the big reserves have big canine units. So we're, we're simply making that accessible for particularly small reserves that don't have the funding or, or the knowledge to, to set up something like this. So we want to help as many reserves as possible. And, you know, we can give advice on everything, basically, from setting up the kennels, um, appropriate kennel sizes and, you know, setting up the whole operation. Um, yeah, I mean, like you say, the issue is still very much there. And I think we're just one of lots of things that we can do. I wouldn't say that we're the, the one bullet to the problem, but we're, we're, we're a big part of that. And I think people are coming to terms with the fact that dogs do have that incredible ability. And the dog units are certainly becoming more popular, and particularly in the bigger reserves where they have a, a really big canine units now. And um, it's really the smaller reserves that we want to help that don't have that expertise, funding or ability to go forward and, and get the dog unit. They simply don't know where to begin. So I think we're making it we're making it accessible to reserves that perhaps thought they couldn't do such a thing. Mm. Um, so that's what we bring to the table. We bring our expertise and also obviously the, the dogs. That's really powerful, especially like you said, since you focus on the smaller reserves that I mean, it's just as important to protect their wildlife, but they just might not have the means to afford one of these dogs or, like you said, all the infrastructure that goes in. I mean, I'm sure I'm exactly. sure it's a lot. It kennels yeah. and handlers and, and making sure that they're healthy, you know, vets. I mean, all, all the things that comes with having a working dog. I mean, it's not just like... I'm adopting mm. a little French bulldog or a little a little puppy yeah. over the weekend. I mean, even that's a lot of work. So just imagine a working dog where that is they are a part of the group, of the anti-poaching group. Like they are a part of the team. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Couldn't, couldn't have put it better myself. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they're definitely, they definitely are part of the team. Um, and it's it's a real investment to to get one of these dogs. Mm. Yeah. So let's go back to you for a second, Jack. Why, why? Why? Because I know so many people where it's like their dream is to become a zookeeper. You became a zookeeper and then you helped start this awesome black rhino breeding program at the zoo where there weren't even rhinos before. So what keeps you going? Why are you so involved with Dogs for Wildlife? What it, What is it for you that this means so much to you? Um, I think, uh, well, basically because it's real life conservation. The zoo, you know, people always describe it as this arc that is an insurance population if something were to drastically happen with wild populations. And it is, I think, in my opinion, it is quite an important thing to have that. Um, but it's a very slow process if you think about it. You know, a rhino, for example, is pregnant for 15 months you can't simply pop out loads of babies. So it is a really slow process. And this, this little side project of mine, I think it's really me helping those wild populations, which, you know, I know that the animals in the zoo are safe, but there's all these animals out in the wild that could be shot at any time. So it was just an amazing opportunity not to be missed, really. Mm. And so I'm just so amazed that these little puppies can grow up into uh, rhino saving <laughs> anti poaching dogs. Hmm. I have to make sure to ask you for some of these photos because I obviously followed dogs for wildlife too, but just so that everybody can see 
Well, one, they're beautiful dogs. I love dogs. So these are gorgeous dogs and they are not small. <laughs> I've seen some of the videos of them practicing apprehending and, and all that stuff. I mean, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of an apprehending dog. Like, like but again, no. it's better than a freaking rifle to the face because that's another yeah. thing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I said to you about this last time, but I was, uh, uh, the guys help. The guys asked me to help with some training, so uh, we went to this disused airfield, which is really perfect for training. We use it quite a lot, and um, it's all overgrown and uh, it's quite a vast area. Um, it, it really does look like the African bush in in some lights, hmm. so it's really perfect. So it's really overgrown. So they just said walk in in that direction and leave a trail. Don't make it too complicated because um, the, the dog was still quite young at the time and just go and hide under a bush. And they gave me this little piece of rag, this little cloth, bit of cloth that the dog absolutely loved. And that was, uh, that was her reward. So I went and hid in this bush. And I tell you what, it's the most frightening experience. I can imagine. <laughs> <In tracks. laughs> you... Uh, it was quite a while ago and I'm talking about it now and it, it seems like nothing. But at the time, you get this real sense that you're being, you know, you're being trapped by a predator and you get this real prey drive in you. You're like, oh, what's going to happen? Like, where should I go? And you've got all this going through your head. And uh, yeah, it's just terrifying. Every um, twig that falls on the ground, you think, oh, is that her? <laughs> it is really terrifying. But yeah, she did her job. and. Luckily, she wasn't trained in apprehension at that point. So um, <laughs> she just had the little rag that I was holding. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great fun. But it's um, it really does make you appreciate those dogs and mm. what they're capable of doing. Yeah. I should ask you this earlier, but when does a dog apprehend? Because obviously the, they're not going to be apprehending every single person that they come across. So when when does it get to the point where apprehension and maybe if you want to explain exactly what that means because that, that's a little different you know what apprehension actually is um and yeah, sure. when it is employed in the field yeah sure so apprehension is only used as a last resort basically and the word um, apprehension we, we never use attack because an attack is basically an uncontrollable dog that's just going after whatever it wants to in its predator state. But an apprehension is a controlled um, bite on a poacher, a trainer, whoever, whoever it may be, whoever the target may be. And they're trained to bite certain parts of the body. So in this case, it's a gun holding arm. So it's to disarm the poacher. So it is at a last resort um, if shots have been fired because they do, they do do some damage to the arm, not extreme damage, but they, they do harm whoever um, is in the firing line. So yeah, like I said, it is absolutely a last resort if the conflict can't be settled verbally. And if they don't give themselves up, then the dog is released. Yeah. That so makes we always give, give them that choice before the dog is released because it is, it is a powerful force <laughs> um, coming towards them. Another question that I get asked quite a lot is, are the dogs safe in this environment? And it, there, it is a very rare occurrence that a dog is shot. Um, I haven't actually heard of any dogs that have been shot in the line of anti-poaching duty. And this is basically because a dog doesn't run in a straight line. They pick which the certain terrain is is easiest and they're very fast they can get up to about 30 miles an hour at full pelt and they're very difficult to get a shot on basically so yeah it's it's very rare well like i said i haven't heard of any cases where dogs have been shot in some cases they do wear a bulletproof harness and uh, if the scene is particularly dangerous but obviously this adds weight to the dog uh, making it less agile. So in some cases, it's actually not beneficial to have that bulletproof armor on them. So yeah, they are a, a great addition to an anti-poaching unit. Hmm. I'm really glad you brought that up as well, because that's a question that I definitely have. And, you know, you can go on social media and you see that 
multiple rangers were killed in the line of duty, you know, just protecting their park. Um, and I would imagine that while let's fingers crossed that a dog wouldn't lose its life in the line of duty. I mean, it is a dangerous job that they are going into just by the nature of the job. Yeah. Yeah, it is hundred percent. But like I was saying a little bit earlier, just the dogs being there really, really puts people off going into these reserves as well. So you do have that factor, which is an advantage for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to get tracked down by a dog. <laughs> <laughs> These dogs are badass. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, yes. Like I said, I've I've seen enough videos and stuff. I'm just like, oh my God, that's amazing. Uh, hopefully one day I would love to to see one or meet one because i mean at the end of the day they're dogs like i mean they're very used to people but they just have a working job um so yeah that would be absolutely yeah absolutely awesome. yeah so how yeah we'll somebody... have to get you out there oh my god please <laughs> um so yeah because my last call um my last interview that i did that that will be coming out before this one um yeah he has this really cool like brand new adventure style safari that they're trying in tanzania and he's like yeah we need a couple guinea pigs to try this out and i'm like sign me up <laughs> i will 100 percent be your guinea pig just make sure i don't get any kind of bowel disease and i don't get eaten those are my only requests I'm fine with anything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> so definitely get over there. Maybe meet some dogs in the meantime. That would be amazing. Are you yes. going to get out there? Uh, probably. I mean, why not? Wow. I've been to Tanzania before. <laughs> I've, I've spent a lot of time in Tanzania. Um, yeah, I did nice. like a, I was invited. So Courtney that I just went to Nepal with that. I just, I have yeah. just released my podcast series on. She was doing a women in conservation documentary in Tanzania and invited me along. So I've spent actually quite a lot, a lot of time in Tanzania before. So, and once you're down there, I mean, it's not that easy to get out from country to country, but it's way easier than when you're halfway across yeah. the world. <laughs> so, so wherever the dogs are employed, that would be, uh, that would be really cool to go like meet them in the field. Yeah. And maybe you can come down too and meet me wherever, wherever I would be, wherever the dogs would be. That would be so, oh my God, let's plan this trip. <laughs> Let's yeah, make this I mean, happen. I was uh I was actually planning on going um to Emire last year. Um because I haven't actually been seen our dogs in action. Oh in Africa. really? Oh my gosh. Yeah. You need to yeah, of all so, people. <laughs> <laughs> because we're quite a new organization, it, it tends to be just the essential people going over, so the trainers basically. So um yeah, but I'll I'll have to go over um soon. We do also want to as part of our organization we feel that the community is really important we really want to push that without community involvement and community um, engagement programs in place education you know it needs to be coupled with things like our projects so then we have donated money to for example a rabies vaccination program which helps to vaccinate dogs, uh, domestic dogs against rabies in the villages surrounding the Amira Reserve. And um, it's really cheap. It's like a few dollars for one dog to be vaccinated. Mm. Um, but this means that the dogs aren't getting rabies and then they aren't, you know, bite, they do bite kids and then kids get rabies. And because of the severity of rabies, it's very hard to treat and very expensive to treat. And people simply can't afford it it's i think a couple of a, a few hundred dollars to just go get the treatment for um, a child or with rabies and that simply isn't a possibility with some of these people because they're so poor so if we can solve the problem before it gets to that stage you know vaccinating the dogs against rabies getting them neutered so there's less dogs around you know that benefits people as well and it, ultimately it benefits wildlife as well because the domestic dogs in these villages you might have uh, seen loads of dogs when you're visiting Nepal and um, they basically run free and wild don't they so they can encounter wildlife at any point and you know you've got precious animals that can still contract rabies you know 
Canine um, distemper. Um, that's ten, a big issue. Canine distemper with the um, wild dogs. So Hyenas, yeah. yeah, controlling these diseases is is quite important for the wildlife as well, and also for our anti poaching dogs. You know, we don't want them getting rabies as well. So it benefits a lot of people. So yeah, yeah we want to become. We want to set up uh, lots of community engagement projects um, as we develop as well mm-hmm. and really get people involved yeah and I, I love that you bring that up because I mean it's so easy to just love dogs and maybe there's somebody listening where they're like oh my gosh I would absolutely love to support in some way so if someone no matter where they're at in the world how can they get on board and help dogs for wildlife yeah um so I guess the first point of call would probably be to go to our website um, so you can read more about our work. Um, we do post a lot on social media as well, so updating people on what we're doing um, and on the dogs. Um, if you want to, if you like the look of a certain dog that we have, we offer adoption packs. So um, we we do an adoption pack, um, which we found on our on our um, online shop, and um, you get updates throughout the year about how the the dog is doing and um, a little bit of history surrounding that dog um, things like their favorite toys and their character and um, their family tree so um, yeah if you if you are a real dog lover and you want to get involved and we we do offer those dog adoptions Um, yeah we have lots of merchandise online as well Um, we have good connections with photographers and artists so we've managed to develop uh, greeting cards and um, and prints. So yeah, there's there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, obviously, donations are very much appreciated as well. We're also trying to connect with businesses which want to do more for conservation. Uh, in fact, we've got one uh, dog food company here in the UK which are fully sponsoring a dog. Wow! So from puppy right. Uh, they're sponsoring Shinga, um, who's going to Amire. Um, so they're fully sponsoring her throughout her 18-month journey from birth to um, deployment out in uh, Zimbabwe, which is a huge expense. Um, so, yeah, we really want to get businesses involved um, as much as we can. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's get all the businesses involved. I mean, it just makes sense. Like that that's a natural partnership and I'm sure there's more out there that would absolutely love. Is there anything in particular that you that you all are needing, especially since you're a newer nonprofit? Um, even if someone might not have means to like, okay, I can't sponsor a dog, um, but I don't have this, but maybe I have some other service that I could offer. Like, is there something else yeah. that you, that you guys are needing that just hasn't been fulfilled? Um, so at the moment we are trying to make our way, make headway through the paperwork, which is to do with developing a charity or registering, sorry, as a charity. Um, so if, yeah, if anyone has experience in setting up a charity within the UK, um, any help would be much appreciated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, someone might be able to, that yeah. might be listening. Might I have the slight, you know, like might really have some knowledge on that. Yeah. I mean, like, like you say, um, there are all these skills involved, which you don't even think about in conservation. But um, now that I'm uh, helping to run this organization, you know, I'm doing things like design and answering constant emails and <laughs> social media presence. And, yes. <laughs> yeah. All these uh, video editing and all these little skills, which you never thought you would need in life. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, it is certainly a team effort. Uh, we, one thing that we do need to look into is getting legal advice as well, because obviously running a charity um there are certain stipulations you have to stick to so any lawyers want to get involved um that would be really really appreciated and you know just generally if anyone listening is wanting to help us fundraise you know if you don't have access to a substantial amount of funds (laughs) um fundraising is a really great exercise it boosts your mental health as well doing good and you can use whatever abilities you have. So 
you know, I mentioned earlier artists and photographers, um, but also, you know, if you're a baker or you're good at sewing or whatever ability you might have, um, that's always the best thing to use to fundraise. Um, so yeah, if you're a keen uh, baker and you want to have a bake sale, um, it's always a good way to start. Mm. Yeah, that's perfect. That's something I've been advocating for on most of my recent episodes. It's like, we all have a purpose and we all have something that we're really good at and using that for conservation. So if you are a great photographer, if you have all these different skills, like that doesn't mean that you, you're not separated from the conservation field. Just find a way to use that to help. Um, and like you said, like a bake off Absolutely. or like bake sale, or if you have a bakery and you're like, okay, so today this percent of my profits is going to be donated to dogs for wildlife. This is what they do and, and why they're awesome. And you know, why you need to buy 10 cakes from me, like, <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, it's like the quote, do a little bit of good where you are. It's all those little bits of good, um, added up, which will overwhelm the world. Mm. Oh, that was a gorgeous quote. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we make change is all these little things that just compound and compound and compound and compound. Yeah, it's oh. definitely a team effort. Mm -hmm. It's going to take all of us. It takes an army, all of us across the world. So what's the best way for someone to get a hold of you? So like, let's say they have an idea and they're like, Hey, Jack, I heard you. Um, ooh, I, I have this idea. So how can someone get a hold of you? Um, yes. Yeah, so we can be, you can hit us up on all our social media channels via our messenger. Um, or you can send us an email, which is info at dogs for wildlife.org. Yeah. And that's with the four since in case some, someone isn't watching four. it. Yeah. Number yeah. four, like, yeah, the number four, not F O R. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I have links to that, all that stuff, of course, but in case someone listening, yeah, dogs for the number four wildlife. So, well, this has been so much fun. Excellent. Jack, is there anything else that you want to throw out there as kind of like a parting thought? Put me on the spot, bro. I know I'm good <laughs> at putting people on the spot. It's kind of what that's I do. Your job. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, pretty or much a piece everything. of advice for someone that might be in the field. I mean, anything, anything that you just want to make sure that you're like, I want to make sure someone hears this. Yeah. I mean, I do want to, I don't want to state that I'm in no means an expert, but you don't have to be an expert to make change. Um, and I'm, I'm still quite a young guy and I'm constantly learning and developing and yeah so if you are enthusiastic about wildlife and you want to make a change just go for it whatever capabilities you have whatever abilities you have um, use those abilities to your advantage and um and let's keep fighting for wildlife basically i can't think of a better way to end this interview <laughs> than than that right there that was perfect that was perfect you all heard it Y'all heard it from Jack. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your degree. If you want to help, there's a way to help. There's a way to help. Yeah. So. 100%. Well, thank you, Jack. This was so much fun and I cannot wait to share your story because this was great. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I hope to hear from all of your listeners that want to help uh, <laughs> supply anti-poaching dogs across Africa. <laughs> yes yes we will i'll make sure that if anyone reaches out to me they'll get in contact with you <laughs> <laughs> awesome hey thanks again for listening to this episode of rewildology if you like what you heard hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode do you have a cool environmental organization travel story or research that you'd like to share let me know at rewildology.com until next time friends together we will rewild the planet